Good morning again. Thank you, Miss Cheryl, Ronnie, Randy. I greatly appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and, and tell you we're going to be in, in John chapter 10. We're going to continue our study looking at, uh, looking at John as we move 22 through 42 this morning. While you're turning there, on Nash asked me about filling the pulpit this morning. And <clears throat> first of all, I said, have you prayed about this? He said, of course. I said, well, continue to pray. And I said, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a joke and a three points kind of guy. You know, um, I don't do real well with that. Sometimes I can get long-winded. Sometimes I can get loud. So I'm going to preface you the same way I do any of the ball teams that I coach. If I get really loud and I get really deep, I'm not mad at you. I get passionate. The more passionate I get, the louder I get, the louder I get, the deeper I get. And the louder this gets. So I felt like a little kid this morning. Some of y'all were in here. I was down here. We were playing with it. And, of course, I was changing my voice and just hearing my echo and, and different things this morning. Uh, I'm excited to be here this morning, and I am excited to be able to share the Word of God with you this morning. As you might have noticed on the sign, I have titled this passage, A Promise from Solomon's Porch. And I, I want to ask you this before we get started. Have you ever made a promise to somebody that you couldn't keep? Have you ever been promised something that wasn't kept for you? I would like to say that I can say I've made a promise to our youth, and I have yet to break it, and never will. I am 100% with our youth. I promise them that I will fail you. And I will, unfortunately, not because I want to, but because I am human and I'm fallible. But we get a promise this morning that comes from God that we know that we can trust in and will not be broken. So if you've made it there and you can, I would ask you, as Brother Randy also did, to please stand in reverence and honor of the reading of God's Word. I will be reading and preaching out of the New American Standard this morning. And the word of God says in John chapter 10, verse 22, At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we just come to you, Lord, humbly before your throne of grace. Father God, just so thankful for your word, so thankful, God, for the promise that you have given us in your word. God of eternal life if we are your sheep, if we are children of God and have a relationship with you, Father. Lord, I pray that as we unpack this text this morning, unpack your word, God, that you would just help me, Father, to accurately interpret the scripture, Father, and, Lord, to apply it accurately. Lord, that truth would be spoken and truth would be heard this morning. 
Father, I pray for everyone that's listening and that will be listening, God, that you have prepared their hearts and minds to receive it. Father, knowing that it's your words, not mine. So, Father, I ask now that you hide me behind your cross. Father, I pray that I would decrease and you would increase. For it's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so, again, we have, we have Jesus here. And the Feast of Dedication, which is also known as Hanukkah. Now, some people uh, may reference it as the Festival of Lights. So, this series of festivals has been going on for a while, and Jesus has been preaching in the temple. Now, their festivals are a little, a little different than where we're at today. So, you think festival, first thing pops in our mind is peanut festival, right? So, go pay way more than you should for food and drinks, uh, see some lights, exhibits, and uh, get to ride some rides. So, that's kind of our mindset, right? But it was a little different here. So, there was a different setting that was going on. So just to kind of paint this picture for you, for years there have been false prophets that have come and have claimed to be the Messiah. There have been false promises that have been made that have been broken. So you have this, this festival that's taking place, and this festival's taking place for one primary reason, and that was whenever the Syrians were defeated, They celebrated this as their redemption from the Syrians. So this festival is strictly for that. So it was a, it was a time of hope. It was a time of, of thanksgiving. But it was also a time that they were, they were under a lot of stress. And there was a lot of worry. And, uh, and then with Jesus being here, there was a lot of confusion. Who is this guy that claims possibly to be the son of, son of God. But he's a man. We know who he is. We know where he came from. We know his family. So a lot of confusion. So he, he's out there. It's wintertime. And he moves around to Solomon's porch. And my granddaddy taught me a lot of things whenever I was little and all the way up until I was a grown man. And one of the things that doesn't take long to learn is that if it's cold and there's a north wind blowing, you need to get out of it. You can get out of it and get warm, right? So Jesus has meandered over to the east side of the temple. That north wind isn't quite as bad, isn't quite as cold. And he gets out there and all of these Jews surround him. Not necessarily hostile at this point, but they're needing some information. You ever, you ever ask somebody for advice? And they just won't give you a clear-cut answer. Or you ask somebody a question, and they won't give you a clear-cut answer. It's kind of get this, it's almost like they're speaking in parables. I remember one time, <clears throat> I was 18 years old. And my dad used to always try to give me a lot of advice when I was younger, coming up. Samuel's age, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I never listened. I always thought I knew everything anyways. So I figured this was payback. So 18 years old, I go to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, I need, I need your advice. I need to know what to do. And he looked at me, <clears throat> sitting outside on the back porch, which is where he always sat and smoked a cigarette because mom wouldn't let him in the house. And uh, so he's sitting there, and he looks up at me, and he says, Son, he said, you got to make this decision, not me. I said, I know, Dad, but I, I'm coming to you. I need your advice, and I need you to tell me plainly, right? Just tell me what I need to do. Like, I know all these years I thought I knew the answer. I don't know the answer. I need you to tell me the answer. He said, son, I can't make that decision for you. He said, you should already know it. What I failed to see there at that time is very similar to what the Jews failed to see here in Christ. Verse 24 says, the Jews gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Christ? Tell us plainly. So I can understand their frustration because I was so upset. I'm like, you know, the one time I come to you and I really want you to tell me what it is, like you won't tell me, like for real. But he was trying to teach me something, and really he was trying to open my eyes to see something he'd already taught me. See, I was looking with one set of eyes at what my dad was trying to tell me, very similar to the way the Jews are 
looking with the human eyes and a human perspective of what Jesus has been doing for them. See, they wanted that verbal, I am the Son of God. That's what they wanted. They, they needed to hear it. Whether they wanted to hear it because they were looking to stone him or whether they wanted to hear it because they needed just some clarification and some peace. That's what they wanted. A lot of times that's what we want. We want that verbal cue from God, right? Like, God, I need your help. I need your help. Please show me. Open my eyes. Show me. And we're looking for that visual or we're waiting for that audible. And we don't open our Bible. We don't look at it. We don't read it. A lot of times I know whenever I'm seeking that guidance and everything with God, I'm just like, look, just hit me in the back of the head with a two-by-four. Open my eyes so I can see it, please. I want to follow you. I want to do what you want me to do. And a lot of times he's already shown me. I'm just not looking here. I'm not really seeking God. I am, but I'm also seeking my own intent. See, the Jews, whichever translation you want to go with, were seeking their own reasons. That's why Jesus tells them. He says, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 25 says, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. These testify of me. So I've already told you, right? So about three months prior to this is what we looked at last week. So in verse 7 through 9, Jesus had already laid it out for them. And in John chapter 10, verse 7, it says, So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, Christ had already told them who he was. But there was a problem. They were not the sheep of God. So what does that, what does that mean? That they're not the sheep of God. Not born again, believing in Christ. Doesn't have that personal relationship with Christ. Like they knew the text. They knew the law. They understood it. They had a head knowledge that was beyond anything that we probably have. Definitely more than what I've got. And they knew all of that. But they couldn't see the trees for the forest. When we get wrapped up in our own reasonings for things to be done, when we get wrapped up in everything that we want and we pray with our own motives seeking our own will even as believers it's hard to see what God has for us we're blinded by our own ambition we're blinded by our own desires so we get we get that way sometimes right This morning in Sunday school, we was talking about the church at Laodicea. We was talking about how they're, they're lukewarm. They're neither hot nor cold. They're, they're wanting to kind of straddle that fence. They think they've got everything figured out. They've got plenty of money. They can buy whatever they want. Everybody comes through Laodicea as a major trade route at that time. Had their own banks. And they had it going on. But God tells them, because you're neither hot nor cold and you're lukewarm, I vomit you out of my mouth. I'm afraid sometimes we, we as a church, big church, corporate church, America, we get to that point where we think we're good and we've got it. We'll ask God for something when things get bad. But if things aren't bad, we're like, hey, I got it. I got it. I'm going to put you over here while I focus on this because I've got it. How many times do we get on Facebook for a, for a message or, or watch a video or listen to a sermon or come to church and check off that box? We're not here to listen. We're just 
here to here. <laughs> My wife told me there's two very differences in hearing and listening. I get accused of it a lot, unfortunately, uh, especially if I'm involved in a movie or, or playing a video game with Samuel. I'll hear what she's saying, but there is no listening going on. How many times do we hear the word of God being proclaimed? But we're not listening. It doesn't hit us here. It's not, it's not taking the effect and the hold in our life like it needs to. I want to read you the lyrics of a song. And as I'm reading the lyrics of this song, or before I do, I want to tell you a little bit of backstory. This is it's a song by a young man. It's the initials of his name is NF. He grew up in Michigan. Um, his parents divorced at an early age. He lived with his mom until his stepdad started abusing him. He went and lived with his father. He graduated from high school. And he started, he in, submerged himself in the rap environment. He submerged himself in music, an outlet for him and his raising and his pain and his anger. From 2013 into this past year, he's won several Dove Christian Music Awards. He's had number one albums. This section of verses is, is, is from his song that is titled, O oh God, or O oh Lord. And this is what it says. It's easy to blame God, but harder to fix things. We look in the sky like, why aren't you listening? Watching the news in our living rooms on the big screens and talking about if God's really real, then where is he? You see, the same God that you're saying might not even exist becomes real to us, but only when we're dying in bed. When you're healthy, it's like we don't really care for him. Then leave me alone, God. I'll call you when I need you again. Which is funny. Everyone will sleep in the pews then blame God for our problems like he's sleeping on you. We turn our backs on him. What do you expect him to do? It's hard to answer prayers when nobody's praying to you. I look around at this world we walk on. It's a smack in the face. Don't ever tell me there's no God. And if there isn't, then what are we here for? And what are y'all doing down there? I don't know, Lord. That really resonated with me the first time I heard it. Because I think about where am I at personally and where are we at corporately. There's a lot of people that come to church for whatever reason. To hear a word, to say that they've been there so that when they go back to work on Monday, they can say, yes, I was at church. When somebody asked them, maybe they've been putting pressure on them to go to church. Yep, I was there. But I find a lot of times we don't come to really listen to what God is trying to tell us. He is begging and pleading with his people to open their eyes and to see what he is doing for you in your life, to see what he has for you in store for your life and for his kingdom, and not just this life, but for an eternal life that is way more important than whatever we've got going on here today. See, we get caught up so much in this world, and we get caught up in, in making sure that we're at the correct status, or we've got a correct house, or we've got a correct job or car, or maybe I need to make sure that I take my family on three vacations this year, or maybe it's that I need to make sure that my child, that my son is, is, is the best at this, and he looks the best, and, and we get caught up in that. We pour so much time and energy and money into it that we can't listen to God. We claim to be Christians. We claim to be people that understand and know him. But are we? Are we living it? Are we listening? The Jews claimed to know what was going on. That was, that's what just, it drives me crazy. I talked with Nash. I said, it blows my mind that you've got people that knew the law, 
to the letter, knew a Messiah was coming, and could not see it. Just totally blinded. But then I was the same way for 27 years. Grew up in church. Went to youth camp. Couldn't see it. Knew who it was. Didn't see a need for it. Didn't understand it. And maybe that's where they were. Maybe they were so hung up in their status and they were so hung up in Judaism and, and knowing that as long as the Christ didn't come up, they, they kept their position. And they were prominent people. And knowing that if Jesus was who he really said he was, that that would change everything. I honestly believe sometimes, I know I've, I've gotten like that. I've gotten like that because I've been, as long as I stay here in my little safe zone, I'm good. Jesus calls me to do something else. I'm like, whoa, whoa. Why do I need to do that? I'm following you. I know you. I'm saved. We're good, right? If I'm not listening and I'm not obedient, that I'm missing out on what he has in store for me. So we've gotten to this point all the way up to verse 26. And he's told him, he said, I've shown you, you don't believe. I'm not going to just tell you plainly. I've showed you, and I've told you in multiple ways, but you're not hearing me because you're not my sheep. We get one of, in my opinion, the most profound statements that Jesus makes, and it's one of the most peace-giving statements that's in Scripture. And it is a promise of our safety and security in Christ. Verse 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Man, what a promise. What a... What peace and comfort that gives because I don't know about everybody else I know that since I've been saved I have fallen I have sinned and the devil loves to sow these little seeds of doubt that hey you went and did this you sure you're saved you sure do you know that you know are you positive what, you wouldn't have done this if you were saved right you wouldn't have went out whatever it is fill in the blank Jesus assures us here. He says, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Another verse of scripture that I love that goes along with this, Romans 8, 38 and 39. And Paul tells us here, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Praise God. Because I'm going to tell you, I hear a lot of people nowadays in our media, justice, justice. I don't want justice. I want mercy, and I want grace. I can't handle justice. I think if we're all honest, that's where we all stand with God. When Paul is writing to the church in Colossae again in, verse, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Again, what a promise that God gives us that whenever we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord of lords and King of kings, that he gave, willingly gave his life for us on a cross and was raised and sits at the right hand today and you put your faith and hope and trust in that almighty God that you're secure. There's nothing, and Paul covered it, there's nothing anywhere that can take you away. And Jesus made that promise. And he says, no one will snatch him out of my hand. And if we needed to go the next step, says my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I, um, I grew up believing that I could lose my salvation. I believed that I had to stay a certain way. I, I believed I had to live a certain life to keep from losing my salvation. You may be at that point today. Understand that if you're living in doubt, and if you're always scared of losing your salvation, how effective can you be for the kingdom of God? How effective can you be to do what God's called you to do if you're always scared that if I mess up, that I'm going to get hit with a lightning bolt or God's going to punish me for that immediately? See, Satan loves to tell that lie to make you ineffective. He loves to sow those seeds of doubt so that you can't prosper for God's kingdom. Rest assured today that if you are a born-again believer in Christ, that your eternity is safe because there is nothing that can take you away from God. Nothing. So does that mean we can go live it up, right? I'm saved. I got my fire insurance. The Bible just told me. Can't lose it, right? I'm good. I'm good. I can go out and I can do all the things that I used to do before I got saved, right? Alcoholic. I can, go, I can go drink much as I want now, right? Because I'm good. The Bible just told me I'm good. On the contrary. Matter of fact, Paul warns of this in chapter 6 of Romans. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? When I got saved Sunday morning, I don't remember the exact day. I know it was in April, but I forget the day. Well, the day of the week was Sunday. I forget the date. I was heavy in alcohol. I was, I was abusive to alcohol. I was emotionally abusive to numerous people, probably more prominently to my wife than anybody else. Dabbling in a lot of stuff that I didn't need to be doing. And God opened my eyes that morning, and for the first time, I could listen to what he was trying to tell me. I wasn't just hearing it preached. And things changed. See, I still tell people I'm an alcoholic, because I believe once you're addicted to something, and once you have that in your physical body, that it never goes away, but God gives you the power to overcome it. See, for the longest time, I love, absolutely love, to play pool. I love it beyond most anything else that I do. But where are the pool tables in Dothan, Alabama? I guarantee you, wherever they're at, they sell alcohol. So I put my pool stick up, and I put it away. Because God said, you got a choice now, and your eyes have been opened. I feel, like, I feel like Paul, I feel like he just took those scales off of my eyes, and now I can see clearly. 
He said, yes, you're secure. Yes, you are always going to be saved. But now you've got a choice to make, knowing right from wrong. It's uh, something I like to use the difference is ignorance and stupid. Ignorance, you just didn't know any better. Stupid is you knew better and you made a bad decision anyways. There is a difference. Do not go home and try to explain that to your wife. That was a bad idea on my part. <laughs> Did not work out so well. Either way, it, like, it, was, it was bad this way and bad that way, so I just had to hush. One of those lessons you learn as a young man trying to think that you need to be right and explain something. I love you. Just throw that back in there in case it brought up some bad memories, right? No. The Bible's very clear. We should be holy because God is holy. We should always strive to be the best that we can be. Are you going to fall? Yes. Will he catch you? Yes. Praise God. Say so he won't ever break his promise. He won't, he won't never be late. And on the flip side, for all of those people who are always late, he'll never be early either. He'll be right on time. Every time. And how wonderful is that? And we've got a God that loves us enough that every promise he makes, he fulfills it. And he fulfills it at the right time. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how far we think we can run. It doesn't matter what we think we can do to get away from him. He's right there. And one day he knows that you're going to open your eyes and you're going to see. And he's going to welcome you back. And he's already forgiven you. See, whenever you were forgiven, you were forgiven for past, present, and future. God knew what you were going to do. God, he knew I was going to mess up. He knew I was going to fall. And he forgave me anyways. Whew. That's a love I wish I could understand. So now Jesus gives them the information they've been longing for again. In verse 30. I and the Father are one. Now immediately, immediately for the third time in John's text, they pick up stones to stone him. We've always been told third time's a charm. Not so much in this point. See, so when I, when I told you that they surrounded him, some, some scholars believe it was for hostile purposes. Some believe it's for information purposes. I believe the text points us here that it was more of a hostile. They were just looking for a good reason to stone somebody. See, Rome kept the authority for capital punishment, but they could not control an angry mob. Not always. And Old Testament law tells them that if anybody is heretical, that they can stone them. So they felt like they were very much in their rights to do what they were doing. So in verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. <laughs> I love what Jesus does here. Just real quick, you ever met that person, man, they know everything about everything? Like they are just like... Whew always on point, or at least they think, you know. I've heard the comments say, hey, you don't think they know everything? Just ask them. He'll tell you. Right? There's the, there are those type of people. I think this is the type of people that's, that's right there encountering Jesus because what he's fixing to do is he's fixing to throw them a curveball that he knows they can't answer and hit, they can't hit. So Jesus answered them. He says, I showed you many good works from the Father. Which one are you stoning me? So the Jews answered, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. They're justifying themselves here. They can't see the trees of the forest. It says, because you being a good man make yourself out to be God. That's why we're stoning you. You claim to be God. So Jesus, in his infinite wisdom and knowing their hearts, and knowing that just because they've read it and they know what he's about to say doesn't mean that they understand it. Jesus replies, and I love this. Has it not been written in your law? I said, 
you are God's. Y'all see that there? See, he said, in your law, back hundreds of years ago, I said it, that you are God's. So now he's reemphasizing the fact that I am, and me and the Father are one. But he confuses them. How many times has God ever called a human God? And what in the world did he mean? Great thing about this passage and a great thing about my ignorance here is the fact that scholars have studied this for years, rabbis at the time, and nobody knew really exactly what he was talking about. I can tell you the text. And the text comes out of Psalm. In Psalm 82, 6, that's where it comes from. But why would God call men gods? So I'll read it to you so that you can hear exactly what Jesus is quoting here. And he said, I said you are gods and all of you are sons of the Most High. So as I read this, it's going to get a little lengthy and a little wordy, but try to follow me here. Jesus answered them, has it not been written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, being in the scriptures, cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, so Jesus is talking about himself here in third person, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? So what Jesus is saying here, because I said I'm the Son of God, and we've got here in the text in Psalms that I've already told you and called some of you that were, that were false leaders gods. Why, why, why are you fussing at me? See, if God can call somebody else a god and it be a little g god, why are you, you got a problem with me in saying that I'm the son of God? He just called a bunch of folks son of God, so why are you fussing at me? See, they, they couldn't answer this. They didn't, they didn't fully comprehend why. And Jesus had them here and really kind of beating them at their own intelligent game, if you will. It's the great thing about our God is that he knows everything. And that he always has the right answer. So they didn't know what to do. They weren't happy about it. They still looked to try to stone him, and they still looked to try to seize him, but now it was more cause of confusion and anger more than anything, you ever actually won an argument and the person was really madder? Like you, were, like, you were honest, you were right. Or have you ever just killed somebody with kindness? Like you know they don't like you, and you go to them with pure heart, right? With pure heart, people, we don't go to them out of like, I can do this really nicely, and everybody thinks I'm being nice, but I'm really not. No, like a really a pure heart and go to somebody and do something for them, you know they don't like you, and they're just like, Argh. Now, Scripture tells us it's like pouring heaping coals over their head, right? Now, let's be honest, we probably enjoy it just a little bit. But we're being nice, right? No, seriously. I can, I'd love to have been there in all of his, his glory and his pureness. And I'm like, hey, literally the basis for what you're doing is wrong. <laughs> and your law says it's wrong. And your law can't be broken. So why are you mad? And they're just like, Man, you know how frustrating that would get? And he'd done that to them over and over and over. You would think after a little bit of time, they would understand they're looking with the wrong eyes and they're hearing with the wrong ears. How many times has he done that to us? And we're like, yeah, but God, I want to do this. And he's like, yeah, but it's wrong. You're like, yeah, but what if I do it this way, this way? This? Nope, it's wrong. And we keep trying to figure out a way to do it wrong but i'm not really gossiping i'm just we're just talking exchanging general information are you god i'm not i'm not really cussing it's just you know it's just english words we made them that way when we try to justify our sin we always end up on the wrong side None of it's justifiable. If God's convicting you of it, repent. 
If God's telling you it's wrong, don't do it. <laughs> Funny, I said I wasn't going to quote Jerry Clower this morning. Um, Jerry Clower was talking at Samford University. And some students asked him, said, hey, we need some advice. How do you know what's right and wrong? His reply was, and a lot of y'all may have heard this. He said, what's right and wrong? That's, that's a good question, right? And he gave them four questions to ask whenever you've got to make a decision. You're trying to understand, is it right and wrong? And the first one, can I give God the glory for it? Can I say thank you, God, for whatever it is you're about to do? And if you can't, you're finna mess up. Second question is, do you ask other people's advice? He gave the illustration that he was going out on a date one night, and he walked in there. And he said, Mom, is my shirt dirty? She said, Son, if you believe it's dirty, take it off. I'll get you another one. Third question is, do you argue with yourself? Ooh, guilty of that one. Man, I've had a four-person conversation going on with just me. You might think that's hard, but I took the other person's side. Think on that for a while. If you're arguing with yourself, are you trying to justify what you're doing? Because if you are, you're fixing to mess up. For the life of me, I cannot think of the fourth question. Whenever we're fixing to make a decision, or whenever we're trying to understand something, and God reveals to us that it's wrong, accept the fact that it's wrong. That he's trying to protect you. That he's trying to guide you because he loves you and because he wants the best for you don't try to justify the means or justify the end by the means trust God and let him guide you verses 40 through 42 closes out this chapter and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, While John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him. You ever gotten a point in your life where you're beat down? You're exhausted? You're tired? It seems like everybody's against you. The world's against you. And you just need to rejuvenate. You need to rest. It's where Jesus was at. See, whenever he leaves this place where John was originally baptizing, he starts his journey to Jerusalem to be crucified. He had, gosh, in the past four months almost, he had been, they tried to stone him three times just in that short period of time. He was tired. He was emotionally and physically exhausted. He was still man, see. He experienced all the same stuff that we experience. So we can't say, God, you don't understand, because he understands, because he's been there. So where did he go? He went where he heard the Father speak to him audibly whenever he was baptized. He went to a place to where people believed in him and uplifted him and encouraged him. A place where he could regain his strength to move forward. I remember being in college. I was off at Troy University, and I'd come home every weekend. Now, for two reasons. One, so that Mama could do my laundry. <clears throat> and the other one is because, well, most of the time I was wrapped up in stuff I didn't need to be in. And I was tired. See, I grew up in a small community where there's more cows than there are people. You get off Troy University, that was a whole other experience. And for another day that I'll tell you about. But I was tired. I was exhausted. I'd love to tell you I was tired from studying. That's probably not the truth. But I would come home to what was familiar. I would come home and ride with my dad out in the pasture, look at the cows, just to, to be away from the city and the fast life. Even when April and I, our first couple of years of marriage, and we struggled so much, I would go home. 
because it was a place of familiarity. It was a place where I would be encouraged. It's a place where I knew people were praying for me even though I wasn't saved. I knew there was something in that. just wasn't real sure of it. We all get to a place where we're beat down. We're tired. This world is brutal. I pray that you have a place. I pray that this church is the place that you can come and be encouraged and uplifted when the world is constantly beating you down. So where John's ministry started, Jesus' for all intent and purposes ended. He's fixing to head to Jerusalem to the cross to give his life for us. So we've looked at a few things this morning in recap. Are you listening? Or are you hearing? See, if you're hearing, then you know what God has in store for you. You know where God's leading you. If you're just... Did I say that backwards? Thank you. thought about it after a second. Excuse me. I told you that might happen today. If you're hearing, it's just words going in one ear and out the other. You know that there's something going on, but you don't really understand it. You may not even care. If you're listening to what God is telling you, then you have a direction and you have a path that is clear and one that's filled with a promise of eternal salvation. The blessing in all that is that, that you're here this morning and all you've been doing your whole life is just hearing you have the opportunity to repent and to accept a Savior that loves you and that wants you to come to Him and give your life to Him and trust Him. Where are you at this morning? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, so much for loving us. Thank you, God, for promising us an eternal salvation. That God, that no matter what we do, no matter how many times we fall, God, that you catch us and it is secure. Father, I pray, Lord, if there's one here this morning that, that is either doubting their salvation or, Father, maybe, maybe they have been hearing this word taught for years or maybe it's the first time God that you truly open their ears to listen open their heart Lord to listen and God I pray that as they are hearing that Father that they respond respond to you God with repentance Father we love you God and we thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you will do in your son's precious and holy name that we pray.